to kill or not to kill? Well, actually, the question is, should macro photographers kill their subject, an insect, for photos. A lot of the times insects are pretty quick and they like to move around a lot. And to get the best macro photos, you wanna do a stacked photo. So that could consist of tens or hundreds of photos put together, but you need the insect to stay very still. And it's pretty hard to do when they're out in the environment moving around and there's lots of wind. So some people like to take that insect, kill them, and then set them up in some sort of rig to hold them still so they can take whatever photos they need. Now, personally, I do not support that. I think one of the most fun things to do in macro photography is to go out into the field and have that challenge of trying to get the best footy you can by leaving the insect in its environment and having it interact with things. Obviously, we love it when they stay still and they work with us, but again, it's all in the challenge and that makes it more fun. Now, even though I don't support killing insects in order to take photos of them, I do however support the more humane thing to do if you wanna take photos of dead insects. Now, the first thing is if you're just walking around your house and you look near your windows mostly, you'll see that there were probably flies or even bees that got stuck behind your curtain or your shutters and they just kind of died eventually. Now, I definitely don't see the issue in taking those kind of subjects and bringing them over to your little rig and taking photos of those. I have done that before. I've done a fly, I've done a bee, and sometimes when you're outside, you'll even find there's decaying bugs like flies, grasshoppers, anything really. And I don't see the issue in taking photos of those as long as you found them and they are already dead. Now, obviously it's hard to tell if a macro photographer killed them themselves or they found them like that. So. You know, hopefully everyone's just being a decent human being. And the second thing that I would allow for dead insects and taking macro photos of them would be taxidermied bugs, as long as it's done in a humane way. And this is gonna be the main topic of the video today. You see, a year ago or about two years ago, I ended up starting to collect framed insects and mostly moths and butterflies to start. And I made sure to find a business that was doing it the right way. They would find bugs that have lived out their full life and had eventually died of natural causes and then they would take those insects and taxidermy them and put them into these beautiful displayed cases. People could then buy them and put them up on their wall. Now I don't see any issue with this because a lot of these insects are from different parts of the world that you know not a lot of people are able to see. So I think it's really cool that you could have a piece of that in your room and be able to see something you wouldn't normally see. So today I'm gonna to be taking some macro photos of the insects that I have collected over the year or two. And I'm not gonna take them out of the framed cases that they're in. So hopefully the glass doesn't interfere with the photos. I think it'll be okay though. And I'm gonna give you guys the names of the insects and maybe where they came from and other types of information about these bugs. So this video is gonna be a little more informational compared to my other videos, but I hope you'll enjoy anyways. All right, let's get started with one of my favorites and my main focus of my collection and that is the Atlas Moth. The Grand Atlas Moth is a remarkable and majestic insect, renowned for its impressive size and intricate wing patterns. This species is primarily found in the tropical and subtropical regions of Southeast Asia, including countries like India, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The Grand Atlas Moth is one of the largest moths in the world with a wingspan that can reach up to 12 inches, making it a true natural wonder. The lifespan of the Grand Atlas Moth is relatively short, typically ranging from just one to two weeks. During this brief period, their primary focus is reproduction. The adults are not equipped with functional mouth parts and they don't feed. Instead, they rely on the energy reserve accumulated during their caterpillar stage. The larvae or caterpillars of the Grand Atlas Moth are equally fascinating with striking green or brown colors and spine-covered bodies, and they are known to feed on various trees. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Grand Atlas Moth is its stunning wing patterns, which resemble the topographic features on found on a map. These patterns serve as camouflage, helping them blend into their natural surroundings. Despite their large size and imposing appearance, Grand Atlas Moths are not a threat to humans and are generally harmless. They play a crucial role in their ecosystems as pollinators and contribute to the diversity of the natural world, making them captivating species worth admiring. And that's why I have one on my wall. It's definitely one of my most favorite insects. Okay, moving on to the next insect. This one is my second favorite one. I absolutely love the camouflage on this insect. It just blows my mind that evolution has just created this. But the next one is the Halmum leaf bug. It is a fascinating creature hailing from the lush rainforests of Southeast Asia, particularly in Indonesia. These remarkable insects are masters of mimicry, resembling leaves to a remarkable degree. I'm definitely gonna mess this word up, but they are part of the Philidea family, a group of insects that have perfected the art of camouflage. You got that right. Just look at the insane details on this guy. The Halamum leaf bug's appearance is incredibly leaf-like, with serrated edges, vein patterns, and even discolorations that closely mimic real leaves. These leaf bugs have a relatively short lifespan, 
typically living for a few months during their adult stage, which can last up to four months. They focus on reproduction. Mating in the leaf bug world is quite unique as males and females come together and engage in a peculiar form of courtship with elaborate movements and displays. After mating, the females lay their eggs, which resemble plant seeds. The eggs hatch into miniature leaf bug nymphs and they undergo several molts to reach their full adult form. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Halimum leaf bug is its ability to mimic vegetation. This natural camouflage helps them evade predators such as birds and other insects. They are herbivores, primarily feeding on various plant species, which further contributes to their leaf-like appearance. The remarkable mimicry displayed by the Halimum leaf bug is a testament to the wonders of evolution and adaptation showcasing the ingenuity of nature in crafting creatures that blend seamlessly into their environment. If only humans could do that. All right, I have five insects left and they are all butterflies. And the next one we're gonna talk about now is the ruddy or ruddy dagger wing butterfly. This butterfly is a striking and distinctive species that inhabits the tropical regions of the Americas, primarily found in Central and South America. This butterfly is known for its bold coloration featuring ruddy red wings with prominent dagger shaped markings, which give it its name. With a wingspan that can reach up to 3.5 inches, the ruddy dagger wing is a notable presence in its natural habitat. The lifespan of the ruddy dagger wing butterfly typically lasts several weeks. During this time, they engage in essential activities like feeding, reproduction, and the search for nectar rich flowers. These butterflies often visit various flowering plants and play a crucial role in pollination. The males of this species are known for their territorial behavior defending specific areas in pursuit of females for mating. One of the intriguing features of the Rudy dagger wing butterfly is its preference for primary and secondary rainforests, where they often congregate around riparian habitats near streams and rivers. The striking coloration of their wings serves as a warning to potential predators, signaling their unpalatability. This unpalatability is attributed to their larva host plants, which contain toxic compounds that caterpillars sequester, making both the caterpillars and adult butterflies less appealing to predators. The Rudy Daggerwing butterfly is a testament to the diversity of butterfly species in the tropical regions of the Americas, captivating observers with its vibrant appearance and intriguing ecological adaptations. Even though that butterfly is the smallest in my collection, I definitely like its patterns and the color. It's absolutely beautiful. All right, moving on to the next one, the Central Emperor Swallowtail. This species is a striking and regal species that resides in the central and western regions of Africa. This butterfly is known for its impressive size with a wingspan that can extend up to five inches, making it one of the larger members of the Cherexis genus. The Central Emperor Swallowtail's appearance is characterized by its striking black and iridescent blue wings adorned with white spots and streaks. The lifespan of the central emperor swallowtail butterfly typically ranges from a few weeks to a few months. During this time, they engage in essential activities such as feeding on flower, nectar, and reproducing. These butterflies are excellent pollinators, contributing to the reproduction of various plant species in their habitat. They are known to visit a variety of flowering plants, extracting nectar with their long proboscis. One of the intriguing aspects of the central emperor swallowtail butterfly is its association with the moist tropical rainforest forests and riparian habitats. These butterflies are often found in dense forested areas near water bodies and they tend to fly gracefully in the treetops. The striking blue and black coloration serves as a form, I don't know if I can say this word, but a posetematism? Posemitism. A posemitism, warning potential predators that they are unpalatable due to the toxic compounds they accumulate from their larva host plants. The central emperor swallowtail butterfly is a testament to the enchanting diversity of butterfly species in the African rainforest captivating observers with his impressive size and majestic appearance. All right, moving on to the next butterfly. This one is definitely the brightest and most colorful one in my collection, and it is the Lucip Orange Wing Butterfly. This butterfly is a distinct and colorful butterfly species found in the various parts of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and surrounding regions. This butterfly is renowned for its vibrant and striking appearance, making it a delightful sight for observers. The Lucip orange wing butterfly features a wingspan of approximately three to four inches. Its wings are predominantly orange in color with bold black stripes and markings. The vivid orange hue is a notable feature that distinguishes it from other butterflies. This species exhibits sexual dimorphism with males and females having slightly different wing patterns. The lifespan of the Lucip orange wing butterfly typically ranges from a few weeks to a few months. During this time, they engage in essential activities such as feeding on flower nectar and mating. They are known to visit a variety of flowering plants, 
playing a crucial role in pollination with their ecosystems. One intriguing aspect of this butterfly is its vibrant coloration, which serves as a form of aposematism. I don't know if I can say that word right. Warning potential predators that it may be toxic or unpalatable. The caterpillars of the Lucip orange winged butterfly feed on specific host plants, accumulating toxins that deter predators. This is a fascinating example of the co-evolutionary relationship between butterflies and their natural environment. The Lucip orange winged butterfly is a beautiful representation of the rich biodiversity found in Southeast Asia and a testament to the captivating world of butterflies. There definitely seems to be a pattern with all these butterflies and I definitely thought the colors that they had on them were mostly camouflage, but it seems that it's mostly for deterring predators. I also thought it could have been for mating, but maybe it has a bunch of reasons as to why it's colored in that certain way. And we often forget that butterflies are doing a lot of the pollinating and it's not just the bees. Okay, we're gonna move on to our second last butterfly. I really like the name of this one. It is the Aurora Morpho. This butterfly is a stunning and renowned butterfly species native to Central and South America. These butterflies are highly prized for their captivating iridescent blue wings, which seem to shimmer and change in color as light reflects off their wing scales. They belong to the Nymphalidia family and their appearance has made them a favorite among butterfly enthusiasts and collectors. And that's probably why I instinctively wanted to get this one. The Aurora Morpho butterflies are relatively large with a wingspan that can reach up to five inches. It seems like mine was the runt of the litter because it's not quite that big. It's pretty small actually. The remarkable iridescent blue coloration is not due to pigments, but rather result of microscopic scales on their wings that scatter and reflect light, creating a dazzling effect. And this is why I love macro photography because we're able to see these little scales. This unique adaptation serves various purposes from attracting mates to deterring potential predators. The lifespan of the Aurora Morpho butterfly typically lasts for several weeks with their primary focus being feeding on nectar from a wide range of flowering plants. Their flight pattern is characterized by a distinctive gliding motion and they are known for their agility to the treetops of lush tropical forests. One intriguing feature of the Aurora Morpho butterfly is its role in ecological relationships. While their bright blue wings might attract attention, it's worth noting that these butterflies play a critical role in pollination with their ecosystems, aiding in the reproduction of numerous plant species. Their vibrant beauty, unique wing structure, and ecological importance make the Aurora Morpho a symbol of the enchanting diversity found in neotropical rainforests. Now the last butterfly in my collection, but certainly not the least, is the Morpho didius. Commonly known as the giant blue Morpho, it is a remarkable butterfly species found in the rainforests of Central and South America. These butterflies are celebrated for their stunning and vibrant iridescent blue wings, which have made them a favorite subject for photographers, researchers, and butterfly enthusiasts. Now, the first time I saw one of these butterflies, it was at the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory, and they actually have them flying everywhere, and their wings are absolutely beautiful. And the lifespan of these guys aren't that long, and when they fall to the ground and eventually die of natural causes, the conservatory takes them, taxidermies them, and puts them in a framed piece. And I am so glad and grateful to have that on my wall and to appreciate its beauty. The giant blue Morpho is indeed a giant among butterflies. With an impressive wingspan that can reach up to eight inches, the dazzling blue coloration is due to microscopic scales on their wings that refract and reflect light, creating a mesmerizing and ever-changing display of colors. This iridescence not only serves as a visual spectacle, but also plays a role in attracting mates and possibly confusing potential predators. The lifespan of the Morphodidius typically ranges from a few weeks to a couple of months. During this time, their primary focus is on feeding and mating. They are known to visit a variety of flowering plants, sipping nectar with their long, Probiscus. Their distinctive flight pattern includes a graceful gliding motion and they are often found in the treetops of dense tropical forests. Probably staying away from all those predators. One of the most intriguing aspects of the giant blue morpho is its contribution to pollinating in its habitat. These butterflies play a crucial role in helping various plant species reproduce, making them important ecological contributors in their rainforest ecosystems. The giant blue morpho's remarkable size and stunning appearance combined with their ecological significance make them a symbol of the natural beauty biodiversity of the neotropical rainforests. And that's all I got from my collection so far. And it's interesting to see that a lot of the butterflies that I do have all have the same role in the natural environment. And a lot of it comes down to pollinating, which is pretty cool. When we think of pollinators, I'm, you know, I'm just always thinking of honeybees and bumblebees and stuff like that. I never really considered how important the butterflies were. And it's always cool to see all the different patterns and colors. And when we zoom in them with macro photography, we get to see all the scales. And before macro photography, I had no idea that butterfly wings looked like this. I always thought that it was maybe just like flat. I knew when I was growing up, when you touched like a moth or something, there was like that dust that came off. I don't know if that's something similar that butterflies have, or if maybe that dust was just their scales coming off. Definitely something to look into. Yes, when it comes down to it, I do not support the killing of insects 
just for the fact of having good photos, macro photos. But you know, if you're walking around outside and you happen to find some dead insects, why not? I don't see the issue in taking photos of them. It will allow you to study them a little further, maybe learn something a little new, and get the best possible photo that you can. And when it comes to having insects on display like me, as long as you know they came from a reputable business and it was done humanely and they lived out their full life, I see no issue with this. But obviously if you have a conservatory in and around where you live, please go there and check out the wildlife when they are actually alive and interacting with their environment. It is so much better. And if you live in these parts of the world where these butterflies are actually flying around, I am so jealous. Here in Ontario, we maybe have a few cool looking butterflies. The monarch is one of the only ones that I can think of right now, and that one is absolutely beautiful. But again, it is always tricky to try and capture photos of those. But when you do, it's definitely worth it. Alrighty, that's the end of the video for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please leave your opinions on this matter down in the comments. I wanna see what everybody else thinks about this. And until next time, have a good one, guys.